I uh, always appreciate the fact that Mark decided to pass the basket before I spoke, after, <laughs> instead of after. Uh, I always worry when people pass the basket after I speak. You never know how that's going to work out for you. Um, uh, thank you for being here. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to uh, uh, talk to you about energy policy. Uh, we law professors, you probably know, like to begin with a question. And so I'm going to begin with a question. And the question is, why do you think Europe and the United States decided to spend billions of dollars to help the rebels oust Muammar Gaddafi from Libya with bombs and drones, but have done little or nothing to oust uh, Assad uh, from Syria uh, or to help the rebels there? Anybody have an idea what the answer to that might be? <laughs> Humanitarian reasons, yes, exactly. Thank, thank you. Uh, for that. That's what makes a conversation in a class interesting. Um, well, I, you know, look, people uh, can deny that the United States engaged in military operations in Libya, uh, but not in Syria, only because of oil. Uh, but it would be foolish, I think, to believe that oil is irrelevant uh, to that uh, decision or to our foreign or military uh, decisions more generally. Before the 1970s, oil was plentiful, it was cheap. The U.S. energy regulators, uh, principally state agencies in Oklahoma and in Texas, uh, found that their biggest problem was managing abundance. Uh, the U.S. was a uh, supplier to the rest of the world when shortages developed elsewhere. And in 1969, the Shah of Iran offered uh, to sell the U.S. a million barrels of oil a day for 10 years at a dollar a barrel. And uh, U.S. policymakers thought so little of the idea that they didn't even discuss it. He renewed the offer uh, a year or two later, and uh, U.S. policymakers brushed the offer aside. The most conspicuous U.S. policy during that time toward oil was an oil tariff that uh, Dwight Eisenhower had put into place. And the basic goal was to keep foreign oil out of the country and to raise the price of oil enough to keep U.S. oil producers happy, some might say fat and happy, uh, without uh, creating uh, prices so high that consumers revolted. So we used up our oil when Middle East oil was cheap and plentiful, and Venezuelan oil was cheap and plentiful, uh, and we instead used domestic oil and kept foreign oil out of the country. We still pay for that mistake every day. Uh, last spring, uh, following a major policy speech by Barack Obama and his uh, release of what he called his blueprint for a secure energy future, uh, many newspapers, including the New York Times, ran a cartoon by a fellow named Jeff Stoller depicting the eight presidents from Richard Nixon to Barack Obama, each saying one word of the following sentence. We must reduce our dependency on Mideast oil. Nearly a year earlier, uh, following Barack Obama's first Oval Office address, which occurred in response to the BP Deepwater Horizon uh, blow up in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, John Stewart, the Daily Show, Comedy Central, where most of my family gets its news. <laughs> uh, he has 
certainly replaced Walter Cronkite as America's <laughs> most respected newsman, showed clips from the same eight presidents, all promising to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, all establishing deadlines for doing so, beginning with Richard Nixon's in 1980, and uh, offering other energy policy alternatives. And the problem, of course, is that four decades of U.S. energy policy failures are not funny. Ironically, our problem started with Muammar Gaddafi. When he was 27 and engaged in a military coup in Libya, Libya was supplying about a, a third of Europe's oil imports. And Libya then uh, threw out American and British forces. And uh, Gaddafi demanded substantial increases in the price of Libyan oil. Executives of major oil companies who badly underestimated Gaddafi's skill and his determination, essentially ignored him. So Gaddafi went after Occidental Petroleum, which at that time was producing a lot of Libyan oil, and unlike the major oil companies, did not have supplies elsewhere in the Middle East that it could use to fill in the gaps in its Libyan oil. Occidental asked uh, the head of Exxon to supply enough oil at cost to make up for the shortages of Libyan oil that Gaddafi had imposed. And the Exxon president, a person named Jameson, denied that request. And Occidental, having no real choice, capitulated to Gaddafi's demands. This ended the 50-50 split in profits that had been in place in the Middle East since the 1950s. It began the unmistakable and irrevocable transfer of power over Mideast oil away from the large multinational oil companies into the hands of the nations whose land contained the oil. Following Gaddafi's lead, Abu Dhabi, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia all sought higher prices for their oil and OPEC, which since 1960 had been an ineffectual cartel, began flexing real muscle in the control over the price and quantity of oil that would be exported to Europe, Japan, and the United States. The structural factors that had made OPEC ineffective during the first decade of its existence had irrevocably changed. In March of 1971, Texas oil producers announced that they had reached peak oil production in Texas and that output of Texas oil would begin to decline. By 1973, the U.S. was consuming 6.3 million barrels of oil a day, more than we produced. Japan was consuming 5 million barrels a day, more than it produced, and Europe, 13.1 million barrels a day, more than it produced. At that time, Middle Eastern petroleum reserves were estimated to exceed 300 barrels of oil, 300 billion barrels of oil, sorry. In 
while those everywhere else in the world were estimated to fall into less than 50 billion. And we know that in 1973, in the middle of, the, of an Israeli war, when the U.S. Uh, sent uh, supplies and money uh, to Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia announced an oil embargo. Many people in the room here today probably remember the gas lines that followed. Some of you probably remember the odd even days in which you could purchase gas, depending on the last number of your license plate. These shortages I show in my book, I won't talk about it here, uh, were not just a function of the oil embargo, uh, but were really caused uh, more, I would argue, by wage and price controls, particularly price, on, price controls on oil, that Richard Nixon had instituted in 1971. But whatever the reason, it became clear to our political leaders and to our public that we needed, for the first time, to get serious about energy policy in the United States. Richard Nixon became the first of these eight presidents to confront our new dependence on foreign oil, and he thought he had a solution. Needless to say, as was Nixon's want, his solution was grounded in foreign policy. And so he turned to Iran and to Saudi Arabia for support. They were to be the twin pillars, as he described it, of U.S. oil policy and provide both free-flowing oil and anti-Soviet stability in the Middle East. We know what happened to the Iranian pillar. Uh, it collapsed a few years later in the Islamic Revolution in Iran. And even though Saudi Arabia and other uh, key oil-producing Arab states have remained U.S. allies, it is my view that it is they, not we, who hold the key to our relationship. The United States, as we know, continues to support the regime in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in the Persian Gulf because even in, despite their authoritarianism and if the sheiks of the Persian Gulf decide to put down a revolution, we will not intervene. The problem is not that the U.S. has had only the wrong foreign policy. The U.S. has also had 40 years of failures of domestic policy. Congress has enacted thousands of pages of new laws since 1973 relating to energy. But despite the thousands of pages of legislation and regulation that have been written, we have still not solved our nation's energy problems. The fundamental difficulties that first brought energy onto the world stage remain unresolved. With 4% of the world's population, the United States consumes a quarter of the world's oil. In 1970, we imported less than half a billion barrels of oil. By 1980, we had imported 2 billion barrels. Now we import 3.5 billion barrels every year. Much of the oil we now import comes from Canada and Mexico, but we still depend on OPEC oil to keep our cars and trucks moving. In 1973, at the time of the oil embargo, about 
of our nation's electricity was generated from oil. The good news, and there's not much in my talk today, the good news is that producing electric power is now essentially a domestic enterprise. The bad news is that electricity accounts for about 40% of U.S. carbon dioxide emissions. And given the risks from climate change and other pollutants from coal, our heavy reliance on coal-fired electricity has become just another problem that we need to solve. Jerry Ford described our massive reserves of coal as our ace in the hole. I would say today they are a joker in the deck. Coal is our dirtiest fuel. We have spent billions of dollars in search of clean coal. In my view, an oxymoron. Um, and we have not had the same kind of success in producing energy from non-fossil sources as was predicted and hoped for at the beginning of the 1970s. Richard Nixon uh, thought that the breeder reactor of nuclear fuel was a solution to our energy problems. The breeder reactor is a sort of energy's version of a perpetual motion machine. It produces its own fuel. And we spent billions of dollars on nuclear uh, technology, on the breeder reactor, the Clinch River project, for anybody who paid attention to that sort of thing, before uh, Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford both uh, called a halt uh, to that enterprise. With regard to nuclear power, we had uh, experienced in the United States what's known in the trade as a nuclear bandwagon with a huge number of nuclear plants coming on to line in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, there are now over 100 nuclear facilities in the United States, all of which date back to the 50s 60s, and 70s. Um, what put a halt to nuclear construction? Well, in my book, I describe it as Three Mile Island. Uh, Three Mile Island in March of 1979 uh, created a panic in the Pennsylvania countryside. And if you look at it closely, and again, I won't linger over this, but if you look at it closely, the story I tell in some detail in the book, there was justification for considerable concern. Because while the American public was being told there was nothing to worry about, there was a nuclear meltdown at Three Mile Island. And if this was just a blip, people have argued with me about this, if this was just a blip in the end of nuclear power in the United States, and on my own behalf I should say, I can cite as evidence the fact that there has been no new nuclear plant that began construction after Three Mile Island that has come online in the United States. There are a number that were under construction at the time that came online after March of 79, but there has been no new nuclear facility put into place uh, since then. Uh, Chernob Chernobyl in the following decade uh, was a sobering uh, uh, notion of the 
risks of nuclear power. And, you know, after the BP oil spill, after my book was published, we had the Japanese difficulties at Fukushima Daiichi. And so to the extent that we were before the Japanese tsunami about to embark on what people were describing in the United States as a nuclear renaissance, with a lot of money and energy going to new plants, there are two new plants in North Georgia, for example, in which ground has been broken and construction begun, uh, I don't think it's very likely that nuclear electricity is going to be the solution to our reliance on fossil fuels. So what about alternative fuels? Well, again, I can't go through this in any detail. Uh, let me say that the story I tell is not favorable to the environmental movement, which also found its voice during the same period of the 1970s that energy came onto the forefront of American policy concern. Um, the environmental movement, at least during that period, was engaged in a small is beautiful fantasy of returning uh, to earlier and more pristine times. Just to take one example, uh, Barry Commoner's vision of solar power was that we would have a little solar panel on every light post in the United States. Well, needless to say, this is probably not the best way to think about uh, getting our electricity from the sun. The U.S. was ahead of a uh, everyone else in the world in solar technology. And if you look, as I do, at the history of subsidies for alternative fuels and other uh, domestic uh, subsidies for technology innovation, uh, solar energy is the success story. Uh, but it's only recently that we've started seeing the use of uh, large uh, groups of solar panels to provide electricity at uh, power generating uh, facilities. Um, wind, what should I say about wind? I'm always amused by children who are sitting in the back. Uh, and I rode over the Q Bridge today and pointed to our windmill. And I said, there's our wind power. Um, you know, as you know, um, we have uh, great resistance uh, to putting uh, wind on land, uh, great resistance to putting wind uh, off the Nantucket coast, and so forth. Uh, the wind story uh, is one of off and on uh, financing. Uh, mostly tax subsidies, which ended in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, due to a tax reform uh, bill. Uh, Pete Stark, a, a, a very uh, liberal and, and uh, wise uh, Democrat in, in California, wise cracking Democrat at least, uh, said about huge wind farms in California, which was the uh, center of the wind energy movement at that time, those are not wind farms, those are tax farms. And he was certainly right about that. I'll say a little more about uh, ethanol. Um, I'm uh, optimistic about natural gas. Um, we have had a major technological breakthrough in natural gas. Natural gas emits half of the carbon dioxide of coal. And if you wanted to do something quickly and you had a political process that would allow you to do something quickly, uh, I think that our health and our risks of climate change would be greatly improved simply by substituting 
natural gas turbines for coal-fired electricity in the United States. <clears throat> but let me say a bit more generally about domestic policy choices before I open this up to questions. So one thing that's happened, and this is sort of common in American political life, it was particularly pronounced after John Kennedy succeeded in putting a man on the moon in 1969, is that our political leaders like to search for technological silver bullets to our solutions. Solu technological silver bullets as solutions to our energy problem. And so for Nixon, as I mentioned, it was the breeder reactor. For Jerry Ford, uh, it was just sort of keeping things going. But for Jimmy Carter, <coughs> excuse me, for Jimmy Carter, it was sin fuels, which was the idea, not a technological difficulty, actually, because the Germans did it to, to fuel their planes in the Second World War, but the idea that you can make uh, a liquid uh, to run cars out of coal. Well, imagine if he had been successful and in addition to running our power plants, we were now running our cars on coal-fired, uh, coal-based electric, uh, coal-based power. So there are essentially three ways in which, four ways, let me say four ways, in which the government can um, engage or enter into uh, this uh, domestic policy arena. Uh, one is just government procurement. That was the one I was going to leave out. The government actually buys uh, a lot of uh, vehicles. It buys a lot of fuel uh, for our military planes and the like. Excuse me, the government what? The government purchases. Okay. It's government procurement, government purchasing of, uh, of, of, of fuel and vehicles. And so uh, Barack Obama has basically insisted, I think, uh, to his credit, that uh, the government purchases of, uh, of cars and so forth should be uh, cars that are fuel efficient and, uh, if possible, run on alternative uh, fuels. Uh, and uh, he has also uh, engaged in pr procurement efforts uh, for the Defense Department in terms of uh, uh, jet fuels and the like. Uh, but this is a um, minor, a minor entry into uh, domestic policy. That's why I almost uh, didn't mention it. The three ways in which we can really address our uh, domestic issues are to uh, subsidize uh, those fuels that we'd like to have more of, that is to spend money on subsidies uh, for uh, whatever. That's number two of my list of four. Uh, the third is to regulate, and we do an awful lot of regulation of energy in the United States. We require both at the state and federal level electric utilities to purchase their energy in certain forms. Uh, we have, if you walk around your house, you'll see uh, that virtually every appliance uh, in your home uh, has been, uh, has had its energy uh, efficiency regulated by the federal government. Uh, and the most famous of these regulations are the CAFE fuel uh, standards uh, for automobile, the corporate average fuel efficiency or fuel economy uh, standards. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that. And then, of course, the third way to do it is to tax those things that you don't want uh, people to buy, like tobacco for example. Um, and uh, we have engaged heavily in two of those three options. Uh, just before Thanksgiving, Stephen Chu, who is a physicist, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, who is the Secretary of Energy today, uh, was grilled for hour after hour after hour by members of the House Energy Commission, Committee uh, 
on the uh, failed uh, Solyndra uh, uh, power uh, plant. And, you know, everybody in the room knew that the federal government had basically uh, lost a half a billion dollars on Solyndra and it had gone down the drain. Uh, the uh, energy secretary upset the members of Congress who were yelling at him and interrupting him and basically misbehaving um, when he said that he had received over 500 letters from members of Congress that had urged the Energy Department to get its subsidy dollars out the door sooner, at least to worthy projects in their own home districts. Uh, and the public, I think, was supposed to, if it watched this hearing, believe that it was uh, uh, only the executive branch that ever put politics first. That, that never happened in Congress. But interestingly enough, earmarks for the uh, Department of Energy between 2003 and 2006 uh, tripled. These earmarks are dollars that are directed to specific projects in someone's district. They took up more than one half of the total R&D budget for biomass, one third for wind, and more than a quarter for hydrogen projects in 2008. So many members of Congress have obviously been more concerned with benefiting their constituents and their contributors than actually finding a solution to our nation's problems. And many of these energy subsidies haven't worked. The, my favorite story that I tell in the book, it's, you know, again, as I say, there's not a lot of good news in here. I'm hoping that like Ronald Reagan, you're looking for the horse in all this manure that I'm giving you. But, uh, um, but my favorite story, which is in some ways the most telling and depressing, is something called black liquor. So how many people have heard of black liquor? Nobody, right? If you lived in, one of you, if you lived in Washington State, you'd have heard of black liquor. So black liquor is a byproduct of paper production. It's just a, it just comes out when you produce paper from, uh, from wood. And Congress uh, passed an incentive for fuels made from biomass, a tax uh, break for fuels made from biomass, which it estimated would cost a total of $100 million over uh, 10 years, and to Congress that's not real money. The paper companies quickly uh, realized that by adding diesel fuel to black liquor, which had been produced forever, they would become eligible for these tax credits because they will have converted this black liquor into a biomass-based fuel. Uh, Congress uh, knew this. It was told this. Uh, one paper company alone uh, said that it had obtained more than a billion dollars in tax credits due to black liquor. The industry, the paper industry, had obtained more than eight billion dollars. Eight billion dollars, not eight hundred million dollars, which would have been eight times, but eight billion dollars in uh, tax credits uh, for black liquor. And the paper executives testified that it was very important to keep this subsidy going because it was providing jobs and uh, so forth in the Pacific Northwest, Congress finally allowed this subsidy to end, but it took it two years and many billions of dollars after it was called to their attention to do so. Uh, the worst of this, you know, I, I could go on, but I, but I won't. The worst of this is uh, ethanol. Ethanol uh, subsidies, uh, unlike all of the other subsidies, uh, did not come and go. Ethanol subsidies came and stayed until December of last year when they expired. Um, we 
substituted a lot of ethanol. You drive up to the pump, you'll see that uh, the fuel that you're putting in your car has got a certain percentage of ethanol in it. Uh, if you look at it in the aggregate, we've substituted ethanol for about 7% of the oil that we use in cars. But if you sort of try and ask how do the costs of the ethanol subsidies relate to the benefits we received, there is no serious study that I've seen that suggests that the costs uh, were anything like uh, efficient in terms of the benefits. The costs outweighed the benefits enormously. Uh, so, you know, there have been a number of studies over the years. Um, uh, ethanol uh, subsidies uh, raised the cost of corn, raised the cost of food, resulted in uh, um, the loss of, of land for, for, for uh, production of, of, of other non-corn products, a whole series of, of issues uh, related uh, to ethanol, uh, and, uh, and yet every president, including the current president uh, who has run for president, has had to go to Iowa to uh, campaign for office and uh, has supported ethanol uh, subsidies. The uh, only thing that Senator Tom Harkin, a liberal Democrat from Iowa, uh, can agree with Charles Grassley, his colleague on the Republican side from Iowa about, is how valuable ethanol subsidies are to the American economy. Um, when uh, Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, another uh, conservative Republican, announced that he was going to oppose ethanol subsidies, that we ought to put an end to it, Charles Grassley suggested, well, maybe we ought to put an end to oil and gas subsidies as well. And Tom Coburn of Oklahoma lost his enthusiasm <laughs> for that conversation. Uh, but I would argue they were both right. We should have gotten rid of both the oil and gas subsidies and uh, the ethanol uh, subsidies. Uh, interestingly enough, it's very hard uh, to spend money like this efficiently. Uh, we know that. Uh, you subsidize something, you're going to subsidize a lot of stuff that would have happened anyway. So, you're, you know, if half of it would have happened anyway, it's going to cost you $2 in order to get a dollar's worth of benefits. Um, there are things that you can't subsidize. We know we can get a lot more energy efficiency, for example, by uh, driving fewer miles or or inflating our tires properly. Uh, you can't subsidize people to inflate their tires properly or drive fewer miles. Uh, the only way to do that is to tax uh, the uh, costs of driving uh, more miles and so forth. Uh, but since the 1970s, the, uh, the, U the U.S. policy has been to subsidize uh, those things we want, but not to tax those things that we don't want. And I could tell you uh, a long litany of examples of failed tax uh, ideas. Again, the environmental movement, for example, killed the tax that Richard Nixon had proposed on sulfur on the grounds that it was too small. Uh, so um, uh, they're just endless stories. Jerry Ford fired his energy advisor who suggested a 50 cent a gallon tax on gasoline would be a good idea. Uh, Jimmy Carter proposed a nickel a gallon coming in over 10 years. Um, Congress didn't, didn't do that. Uh, I could go on and on. I won't. Um, and the story here is that the anti-tax movement, which found its voice in California in the 70s in a constitutional amendment called Proposition 13, uh, and which anybody who watches uh, television and has seen Grover Norquist uh, in the last year or so knows to be the one piece of glue that holds a fragile Republican coalition together. That is, the one thing that the social conservatives and the economic conservatives all agree on is that they hate taxes and don't want any more taxes. 
has blocked the idea of imposing a tax on those things that we don't want. And I argue that we'd be a lot better off if we taxed uh, those uh, things we don't want and use the money, tax you know, oil consumption, petroleum consumption, if you prefer uh, carbon emissions, if you'd rather go that way, uh, and use the money to reduce taxes on those things that we do want, like uh, jobs and, and wages, uh, for example. Uh, but, uh, but that doesn't have a lot of uh, salience in the Congress, at least not at the moment. Uh, people talk about partisanship and the breakdown of our political system due to partisanship, uh, but the story here is less partisanship, as my story about Tom Harkin and Chuck Grassley illustrates, than it is about regional politics. And regional politics, particularly in the Senate, which is a regional body, uh, have blocked uh, sensible policy and are far more important in the energy area than partisan politics. Tom Harkin and Chuck Grassley can agree on ethanol subsidies. Uh, Texas Democrats and Texas Republicans agree on oil subsidies and so forth. The last piece of this that I want to mention is regulation. And here, as I said, the CAFE regulations are the ones uh, that have been the most important. Before the 1970s, the federal government played a very small role in regulating uh, energy uh, consumption. It was mostly left to the states. Uh, but beginning in the 1970s, for a whole host of reasons, uh, including industry's desire for uniform national standards, Congress entered into the field uh, with a vengeance. Uh, we now have uh, huge uh, regulations. Um, and I just want to say one uh, thing about that, and that is that the debacle in uh, this administration with respect, and it's not the administration's fault, it just occurred during this administration, but the debacle with regard to the failure to enact any cap and trade legislation uh, relating to uh, coal and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions made cap and trade a dirty word. And so Joe Manchin, who is the Democrat, Democratic senator from West Virginia, famously had an advertisement that he ran in West Virginia in which he apparently is a pretty good archer. He uh, put a bullseye up and, and a bow and uh, put an arrow right in the heart of a little sign he had marked cap and trade. And so cap and trade has become uh, a dirty word in the same way that taxes have long been a dirty word. And what this means is, and I'm happy to talk about it if you like in questions and answers, but what it means is that by regulating we are engaged in much more expensive regulation than we need to be. If we had a cap and trade policy for fuel efficiency, so cap and trade, yeah, so cap and trade is you put in an overall cap, but you don't tell any manufacturer how much their cap is. You just give out allowances that will uh, reach the total amount, so say with fuel efficiency, the total reduction in fuel efficiency that you want, and then you let those producers who are efficient, you know, change their automobiles, and they will then uh, 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 engage in trades or auctions of these permits, and they'll sell their permits to the inefficient producers who will then produce large cars. So, for example, if we had put in cap and trade as a form of fuel economy regulation in the 1970s. What would have happened is that Chrysler, who was very good at building large SUVs and, and, and trucks and so forth, just to take an example, would have bought uh, allowances from some of the Japanese automakers who were extremely good at that time in producing fuel efficient cars. We didn't do that, and so what happened? Well, it was, you know, we did average fuel economy, so the Japanese, who were very efficient, started making fuel inefficient cars. That's how we got the Alexis and the Infiniti, for example, and Chrysler, who was not very good at it, started making small cars uh, in order to get the average economy down. 
The only point here is that it's well known uh, that cap and trade would save money in terms of the cost to the economy of regulation, but we're now in a position where we can't even utter the words cap and trade. If you look at Barack Obama's speeches since uh, 2010, you'll see he doesn't say cap and trade anymore. He never said tax. He promised not to tax anybody with less than $250,000 of income, so he can't say tax. Uh, and uh, uh, Joe Manchin and others have taught him that uh, he can't say cap and trade either. So he just increased the fuel economy standards rather dramatically, uh, but he's going to do so uh, without uh, this cap and trade system and therefore in a more costly way to the American economy than it need to be, than it need be. So we're wasting resources through regulation in the same way that we're wasting resources through um, uh, subsidies. Um, and the basic point that I, that I just want to make, and I'll, I'll come to a close with this, is to say that we have never required that the American public pay the price of the energy that it is consuming. The price of our uh, efforts to keep the Persian Gulf open, which as you know at the moment are rather expensive, doesn't show up in the price of oil. It's paid by the American taxpayer through the defense budget generally. Uh, the price of health risks from coal are not included in the price of your electricity and coal. Uh, they are paid through Medicare and Medicaid and other uh, uh, programs uh, relating uh, to health. So that the American political system has never demanded of Americans that they pay a price that reflects the full costs of the energy they use. And nothing that we have done or might have done would be as efficacious in moving us to the kind of energy policy uh, that we need uh, going ahead. Uh, the contrast with tobacco, which I mentioned, just could not be more stark. Could not be more stark. So the risks of climate change due to greenhouse gases pose an existential threat to the globe. And Congress is fiddling around, cross-examining Secretary Chu, while coal and other fossil fuels burn, just as they have in our past. And Secretary Chu ended his testimony by saying to Congress, you better watch out, he said, because we're not competing with China, and started warning Congress about China's impressive efforts to develop its solar energy industry, to develop its wind industry, and he said we must compete or accept defeat. And I have to say, as I listened to him say that, I thought, no, to the contrary. Given the refusal of our political representatives to take the challenges of climate change seriously, or to put the nation's long-term interests above regional and short-term political interests, we should start hoping that China succeeds. Thank you.
question, and, and the, uh, uh, the question that Steve asks relates to the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act, where the effort was to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide as well, but sulfur dioxide which causes acid rain. And um, the idea of a cap and trade system actually had been developed by a relatively conservative economists beginning in the 70s. Uh, EPA actually used it in the 70s uh, relating to lead, uh, getting lead out of, uh, out of certain products. Um, and uh, the Republicans basically agreed to the amendments to the 1990 Clean Air Act only on the ground that cap and trade be used so that instead of having each power facility limited in the amount of sulfur uh, it could spew into the atmosphere that we would have the cheapest, most cost-effective way through a cap-and-trade system of reducing acid rain and sulfur dioxide emissions. And it is the case that this broke a logjam that had been going on since 78 in terms of efforts to, to, to deal with acid rain. Now, you know, at that time, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was President of the United States. Um, the Republican Party uh, did not, I think, uh, think that they had great political advantage uh, to be gained from uh, blocking uh, efforts to uh, reduce acid rain. Acid rain was causing huge problems for the water in the Northeast, as, as you must know. Um, and so, uh, uh, the deal was made that we'll regulate uh, sulfur dioxide emissions uh, if we can do so in a way that does not impose unnecessary and excessive costs on the American public. And it has clearly been our most successful uh, uh, cap and trade program or our most successful probably uh, clean air regulation in the last 20 years. Uh, there is some evidence that, um, uh, that too many permits have been uh, given um, and the cap and trade system, I don't want to be understood. I talk about this at length in the book. I won't do it here. But the cap and trade system is not a panacea for a whole series of reasons. One is it requires a financial market, and the market, depending on financial markets, to work smoothly, as we know, is, is not always uh, the best place to put your wagers. Um, and um, the allowances, the sulfur dioxide allowances, were given away instead of auctioned off. And there's a chapter in the book that talks about what the House bill uh, in 2009 would have done in terms of uh, giving away the allowances for carbon dioxide. And it is a very ugly political uh, picture, I would say. If you auction these off, a cap and trade system operates very much like a tax. That is, you could design a carbon tax and a cap and trade system and you wouldn't know the difference. Uh, but, that, but, if you, but if you give them away, you're giving away billions of dollars in benefits, and the question is, how is Congress going to give those away? And the answer is, not always in the interest of the American public. And so you look at that legislation, and they gave them away in a, in a, in a very bizarre way. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I don't know what to say, except that it is interesting that cap and trade, which sort of originated as a cost-efficient regulatory mechanism in the Republican Party has now become an epithet in the Republican Party and an epithet among uh, many Democrats, uh, as Joe Manchin's uh, example proves. Um, you know, what it means is that we are really handicapped in the sense that if we're going to regulate, and we are going to regulate, the states are going to regulate, the federal government is going to regulate, if you're not going to tax, it's the only way to begin to get energy efficiency. And so we're going to regulate, and we're going to regulate in a way that is most costly rather than least costly to the American economy, and we're going to do so at a time when the American economy needs the most uh, beneficial, the least costly methods of regulating it possibly could. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I mean, you're right that, that, that the 1990 example is a good example on the side of doing this sensibly, but, uh, but it's not an example that uh, would command a majority today, even in the case of acid rain. Uh, 
you painted the environmental movement in the 70s as sort of maybe unrealistic about the, the scale of uh, change perhaps needed. And I'm wondering what you think about the environmental movement today and how it may contribute or not contribute to some making some major changes, you know, in a more positive direction. Well, it's a good question. It's interesting. I gave a talk at Columbia Law School, and there were two members of the faculty who commented on my book, and one was, uh, I would say, uh, to the right, and one was to the left, and one of them announced that the book was way too hard on the environmental movement, and the other one said it was way too easy uh, on the environmental movement, that I, quote, gave them a free, a free pass. Um, the, uh, the environmental movement, um, you know, it, it, the environmental movement has done some important and wonderful things for the country. Do, do not misunderstand me. When it comes to energy policy, the environmental movement has entered into short-term political arrangements that are not sound. For example, in the 1978 Clean Air Act amendments, it aligned itself with Eastern Coal, which is much more uh, risky and dangerous, both in its mining and in its pollutants, than Western Coal, but it did so for political reasons. Um, I know uh, with good authority that Arnold Schwarzenegger sat down uh, in an effort to uh, try and get political support in California within the last few years for a major increase in the gasoline tax. And the environmentalists said, we won't support it. Um, they refused to support it. Um, and the environmental movement, as we know, has been uh, blocking um, uh, a lot of wind uh, energy. I'm not saying they're wrong about this, uh, but it has been a, it's been a victim, I think, of you know inside the Beltway political uh, decision making, uh, and um, um, oh, I was trying to put this gently, but I won't. Uh, elite, not in my backyard, uh, 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 positions, and so uh, the environmental movement. Um, has not played the role that one would hope it would play. I, I had long chats with people in the environmental movement who were supporting the cap and trade bill, which was giving all this money away to uh, mostly the coal interests in order to buy them off in the political process, and said, you know, why don't you support a, a carbon tax? And they said, oh no, we wouldn't support a carbon tax uh, because that's not politically realistic. We're going to support cap and trade because we can get that done. But, you know, when the environmental movement won't support the sort of best policy or won't support a carbon tax, so now there are many of them are on record as being, you know, against carbon taxes for one reason or another. Um, so, you know, I think, it's, I think it's still a problem. I think it's still a problem. I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't know what to say about it except that it's still a problem. Uh, it, we have, I will say this. We have moved away in the environmental movement and elsewhere from this uh, back to the 17th century, pure, small is beautiful, everybody should have a windmill on their front yard and a solar panel on their roof idea of how to do alternative energy. And so there has been progress. There has been progress. Um, and I think the environmental movement um, uh, can play a very constructive role in this. And I don't mean to tar with too broad a brush. I mean, obviously, there have been important members of the environmental movement who have been sensitive and thoughtful and, uh, and, and, and thinking about long-range things. Mark, you better call on people. You've got your hand up. I'm not going to call on you. But there are a lot of people with hands up. Why don't you? No, 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 no. I want you to call on people first, and then you'll take your question. <laughs> we got a lot of hands up. <laughs> um, Professor Graff, could you, um, for just a second, imagine with us um, moving to a less congenial atmosphere than the Yale uh, campus, become the energy czar, and tell us the three things that you would do to change this? Because you've done a great job at telling us what we're not doing right, 
but I would love to hear from you what you would, if you could wave the magic wand, what you would do. Well, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, I would, I would certainly impose a tax on, on fossil fuels um, and, and probably a, a, a carbon tax rather than a petroleum tax so that it covers coal and imposes the largest uh, burden on coal. And I would use the money to protect uh, working people and low-income people from a tax increase by reducing the payroll tax or something else. That would be my first uh, step. Um, I, would, I would try and figure out how to align the incentives for energy efficiency with uh, the benefits of energy efficiency. So that, for, just to give you an example, I don't know how many of you rent, but if you rent and your utilities are included, or you're paying your utilities, let me put it that way, you're paying your utilities, neither the builder nor the landlord has a big incentive for your utility bill to be, to be low. Um, and this is a huge problem for uh, commercial buildings and residential uh, buildings. And we've been doing, you know, a lot of uh, ineffective small things. There is a very long uh, McKinsey um, consulting report in which they say that for $500 billion of expenditures you could get a, a trillion and a half dollars worth of energy efficient, improved energy efficiency. And so I think we really ought to look at energy efficiency. We've become more, you know, in good news, in the good news category, we are producing more economic output per dollar of energy expenditure by far than we did in the 70s. We've become a much more energy efficient economy. Now, part of that has to do with the successes of regulation and so forth. Uh, part of it has to do with the movement from a manufacturing economy to a service economy, which is less energy intensive. Uh, but I would focus on energy efficiency because I think there are some tremendous opportunities there. And I think the third thing I would do is repeal all of our subsidies for oil and gas and, uh, 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 and, and fossil fuels, and most of them for everything else uh, that we're doing. Uh, so those are the three things I would do. Um, my biggest frustration with government is their inability to, to educate us uh, the way you're educating us today. So on, on this topic, are, are you... Did you discover all these factors? And are you the only one? And so that we are dependent on your book. And if so, should you send your book to John Stewart? And, 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 and in other words, how can we get this in, into people's minds so that it's common sense will prevail? You know, it's very, very difficult. You know, when I don't do energy, which for me has been an avocation, I do tax law. And I can tell you the misunderstandings about the tax law are, if anything, greater than those about energy. And I've got books on tax policy, and I've got my energy book, and John Stewart has not called. Uh, <clears throat> neither has Stephen Colbert, um, both of whom reach a lot of people. Uh, I don't know the answer. You know, if I knew the answer to this question, this is a very, very important question, because this is also true for the fiscal problems that we're facing. I mean, a huge uh, set of issues involving uh, the budget, the federal budget, which is on an unsustainable level. I suppose it's also true for the state budget of Connecticut, uh, just to pick another example. And, uh, and there's not a lot of money around for this. I mean, it's very interesting. The foundations spend a lot of money on research. Government spends a lot of money on R&D and so forth. Nobody spends much money on policy education of the sort that we've been talking about today. And you can't do it without money. Um, you know, I'm not a TV personality, so, so you need the right kind of spokesman uh, for these things. But, uh, uh, but, but it's, a, it's a serious problem. And the politicians, you know, I mean, just to go back to incentives, all of their politicians, all of their incentives are to help their contributors, to help their constituents, and to engage in 30-second commercials and sound bites, and this can't be done in 30. You know, I couldn't do it in 30 seconds. I couldn't do it if if John Stewart invited me on. I couldn't do it in two minutes, uh, but maybe I'd get him, get him thinking about it, which would be even better. <laughs>
Well, you know, the, the, you know, if you look to technology advances, the ability to get to oil and gas uh, laterally way below uh, the Earth's surface uh, is a great improvement in technology. And so we can now get to natural gas that we couldn't possibly have gotten to uh, before. And, and in the 70s, there was talk of oil shale that we couldn't get to either. Um, you know, if you look at the oil shale uh, development in Canada, you, you will not like it. Uh, it's really dirty and really polluting and very ugly. Um, I'm actually rather optimistic about the, the fracking uh, process for natural gas. I think it can be controlled. I think there are lots of incentives to control it. Even with the downgrade of, of, uh, of reserves, which happened in the last week or so, you know, to 40 percent, but we were you know, we were estimating 100 years worth of natural gas. We've got a lot of natural gas. And, and the price is such that, that it's actually uh, pretty competitive these days. And we'd be a lot, I know this, we'd be a lot better. The dangers from continuing to rely on coal, the health dangers, are higher than the dangers from substituting natural gas. And the climate change dangers are higher. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. And so this is an area where I think, and this goes back to the question about environmentalists, I think we have to be careful in energy policy not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think that this is good news. I take the natural gas story as good news. And, uh, and the growth in North Dakota, you know, the economic boom in North Dakota as, as good news. And clearly you have to do it in a way that protects drinking water, uh, which is the big risk. But, uh, uh, but I think it can be done, and I think you know we need to we need to make sure it's done without uh, uh, without taking shortcuts. Louder. Since he's a tax professor, I hope he can clarify a very basic confusion. I'm not. When you talk about taxation of petroleum products, are you talking about taxation at the point of consumption or at the point of production? Well, I can, I can actually answer that question. I've done a lot of work on how you do it. Um, the question is, if you're, if, if you're talking about taxing petroleum or carbon, uh, would you do it at the point of consumption or would you do it at the point of production? And uh, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that, that you can collect it. We collect our gas taxes now at the point of production. The federal gas tax is collected as it enters the rack, as it's called in, in, uh, uh, in this uh, context. And you can collect it, at, you, you want to collect it from the fewest people you can collect it from. And so what you want to do is you really want to collect it up the chain as, as early as possible. So when the coal is shipped out of the coal mine, you want to tax it then. If you ask who's going to pay that tax, it's going to be the consumer when they buy the product. And so you have to understand that it's being, the burden of the tax is being borne by the consumer even though the collection is, is coming from uh, the producer. And therefore, you have to do something because energy is, is such a higher percentage of the income of lower income people. You have to do something to protect them from having the increase in the cost of energy uh, 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 produce uh, an overall uh, worse situation in terms of their uh, income and well-being. Here's my actual question. Thanks for clarifying that. If the amount of energy companies are paying in the United States to the U.S. government comparable to that which they are paying to other nations? No, not even close. The uh, ta I mean, you know, anybody who's gone to Europe and 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 looks at the price of gas. I was actually there uh, not long ago. It's about eight dollars a gallon, um, and and the reason for that is that their taxes are much heavier. And it, it, yes, of course they need to increase, and and it's uh, you know and we need to give the money back to people. I mean we don't need to raise we don't need to raise the size of government by doing it. We need to give the money back to people, but we certainly need to tax it higher. And what you see in Europe, of course, is you know you see people driving less. You see a lot more mass transit. You see people using uh, more fuel efficient cars and so forth. You know, it's not an accident that Mercedes invented this little so-called smart car, which I would just describe as a small car. Um, um, but they invented it for Europe. 
Um, you know, they didn't, they brought it here, but they didn't, they didn't invent it for here, and that, and our taxes are a fraction of what they are elsewhere, and the same thing is true for Japan. Um, you know, we, we are, we are a low tax country, and we are a particularly low tax country when it comes to these kinds of uh, energy products. I think I'll reserve the last question for myself, because the time is very short, and uh, I think before, I, a lot of people would like to ask questions, but I think we, we now kind of, a little bit beyond the time we scheduled to do this. Uh, I just have a couple of announcements to ask a question. Yeah, you want to use the mic? Okay. Um, I was saying the time is just beyond up that we had originally scheduled for this meeting, and it's such great interest in your talk. I think it's a testament to that. Uh, I'd like to make a few announcements before I ask one, one last question. One is I want to announce that we did raise $140 for the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there are two sign up. There's a sign up list back there for people who want, like to be on the mailing list to hear about future lectures in the series. We'd be very happy with the way they've gone so far. I'm looking forward to exciting ones in the future as well. And uh, that mailing list also could be used for those of you who may not be in the Occupy Shoreline group, but uh, who might want to become more involved and know more about it. Putting on this lecture series, we have a film series on money and politics. Uh, we have a number of political reach out committees, educational committees, direct action committees that I think you find really interesting and we need your help serving on those committees. And last, don't forget that there's a book for sale out there uh, that goes through some of the things that we've heard today uh, from Michael, but um, way beyond that. And it's just a tremendous education to read and it's an exciting read. Well, that last question I have uh, is. Um, you spoke of regionalism as being one of the reasons that some of these laws that may not uh, be in our best interest of the people of the country have passed. But the other one is obviously campaign finance problems. Um, and I wondered if you could kind of give some notion that I always struck with the campaign finance was an overwhelming problem, but maybe regionalism is the larger one. But uh, in either case, is there anything that people can think about getting done about those so that we could develop more rational Well, I, you know, look, the, the, the problem, I just want to say this, the problem is not Citizens United. Citizens United is part of the problem, but it's not the problem. The problem has been existing for some time. And, um, and, it, and, if, and there's a, actually a, a bit in the, in the book about the uh, transformation of the relationship of business interests to the Congress which occurs during the 70s. And so it's very interesting because if you look at environmental legislation, the early 70s is when the Clean Air Act is passed, the uh, NEPA law, the National Environmental Policy Act is passed, the Clean Water Act. There are a whole host of things that are passed. At, as this goes on, business becomes much more sophisticated and much smarter in its ability to, uh, to deal politically. And there are a number of things, I mean, it's interesting, because one of the books that, that I wrote, in which, again, the this, this story has a lot to do with money and politics, but it's a book that Ian Shapiro of the Yale Political Science Department and I wrote on the politics of the repeal of the estate tax, which are about money. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is where the money is, right, is, is, is in the estate tax. Um, and it's not just a story about money. But there are a whole host of uses of money that even if you were able to go to public financing of political campaigns and limit contributions, which of course neither one is on the horizon, um, water flows around a rock. And so, you know, there are lots of ways that you can use money in, in gathering up forces. And so one, just to name one, uh, the uh, oil industry became very sophisticated in the late 70s of what's now called astroturfing or something, but it's basically gathering people who are, who are employees and so forth uh, to engage in campaigns that look like grassroots campaigns, but in fact are financed by business. The problem of money in politics is pervasive and difficult. The only way to deal with it is, you know, is, is electoral. I mean, we've got to do something electorally, um, you know, 
people talk about a constitutional amendment to eliminate corporate contributions, fine, I'm for it. I don't think it's going to change things a lot, but it'll change things a bit. Um, we've got a system where money is, 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 is overwhelmingly at the center of politics. But we also, I just come back to this question about education, we really have to, have to let people know that we know what they're up to. And, 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 you know, and the difference between regional politics and, and, and paying off uh, contributors is, um, is often a very difficult thing to see. I mean, that is if Jay Rockefeller, so you know, let's pick Jay Rockefeller. He's a liberal Republican. He doesn't need the money to run for office. His name is Rockefeller. And, uh, uh, and for him, it's not about money. Uh, but would you think that Jay Rockefeller, senator from West Virginia, would not be an avid and vigorous supporter of the coal industry? Uh, if so, you know, you'd be wrong. He's going to support the coal industry. And so you have to think about, and I think that you have to think about this. This is the lesson that Ian and I took from our, our book um, in which we interviewed. We interviewed about 150 people in the political process. And that is you have to think about coalition building in order to deal with legislation. And you have to ask yourself, what kind of coalition can I put together that will, that will be sustained? And often it's unusual coalitions. It's often unusual coalitions. And so you have to think about, you know, in this area, for example, you know, coalitions that are interested in foreign policy, which have been completely out of this discussion politically, and so forth. So I think, you know, I, I, look, I'm for getting money out of politics, uh, but I'm also for a whole host of things that aren't going to happen. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I'm an optimist, uh, but I think you've got to think about coalition building. I, look, I think that the Occupy movement has had a major effect in bringing the inequality of the distribution of wealth and income into the public consciousness. And so that's an educational, uh, you know, you want an educational story, that's an educational story. Whether, you know, it's going to mean that Mitt Romney is going to pay 35% in taxes <laughs> on his carried interest, you know, I don't know. I could tell you a story about the carried interest politics that's every bit as depressing as the black liquor story I told you. So I don't want to do that. I want to end on a, on a happy note. But I think you've got to think creatively about coalition building. That's, that's my answer to the political question. Well, thank you very much. I have no idea what to say.